Myths and rumors circulate in a very similar way to the way that microbes spread. They can be contagious in that one person hears something, they pass it on to another person and another, and suddenly a rumor becomes really well established. And I think we've always had this problem, but with the internet and social media, just the scale, the scope, and the speed of it is really amped up. I'm Dr. Seema Yasmin, and I'm a doctor, a professor at Stanford School of Medicine, and director of the Stanford Center for Health Communication. And I'm going to debunk some illness and disease myths. People kind of want to know like exactly how much water should I be drinking, but there isn't that magic number. I think this myth has been circulating for a long time and somehow eight glasses of an eight ounce glass specifically is what's circulated. It depends on your body size and how active you are at a given time. There is no reason to eat your placenta. I do hear from people that they want to eat their placenta because monkeys or other wild animals do it. But the reason that those animals are doing it is because they don't want to attract predators. There is no reason for a human to eat a placenta. Your heart does not skip a beat when you sneeze. I think a lot of us grow up hearing things about sneezing, that your eyes close and your heart skips a beat and you're like dead for a millisecond or something. Um, yeah, clearly not true. Adults have fewer bones than babies, and that's actually true because babies are born with some bones that fuse to become a bigger bone. There is a phenomenon known as the July effect, which wonders and asks this question that if you have massive turnover, new residents starting, new faculty starting around July, then isn't that a more dangerous time to be in hospital? And there have been 300 studies looking into this, and it turns out that it depends on what kind of hospital it is, who you're being looked after, like how experienced they are, but also what kind of illness you are and how seriously sick you are. The take home from this is that if you're sick in July, you still need to go to a hospital and by and large you're in good hands. So your body makes toxins as it metabolizes different things but the thing is your body also flushes those things out. You don't need to be doing anything or taking anything to cleanse yourself. Flat tummy tea is most of them are not good for you. They kind of go under this umbrella of, oh, well, it's natural or it's herbal, but those herbs are no joke. Sometimes flat tummy teas contain senna, which yes, it's a herb, but it's also a laxative. So if you want to crap the way out, I mean, all you're doing is emptying your bowels and becoming dehydrated. Your body does have waste products in it. That's why you pee and that's why you poop. And even when you breathe, you are exhaling carbon dioxide, which is a waste product. But your body is perfectly primed to, to do that, to get rid of what you don't need. People do ask about colonics. You do not need them. You do not need to put coffee up your butt. You don't need to be shoving liquids up there to get anything out. Unless, of course, you have constipation and the doctor prescribes an enema. But if you're healthy and functioning fine, then you don't need to do a colonic. People are making billions of dollars off dietary supplements that many of us don't need, and that includes vitamins. If you are eating a well-balanced diet, you're getting the vitamins that you need, and you don't need to be popping a pill to stay healthy. You need to take a vitamin if your healthcare provider tells you you have a deficiency and you need to top up and take a pill or take a liquid that boosts your level of that vitamin. MSG is not addictive, it's not unsafe, and the thing that I was fascinated with when I was writing this was that those myths that you've heard about MSG, that it's addictive, that it's really bad for you, are all tied to racism and the fact that it was Chinese people owning Chinese restaurants that were using it and that's how it got labeled as something that was dirty and toxic. In moderation, it's no worse for you than regular salt. People have asked me if genetically modified food is safe, whether they should pay more for non-GMO food, pay more for organic food, but GMO food is safe. And the definition of organic, honestly, can be so broad and vague and different from one place to another that most doctors will say, just eat a healthy, balanced, varied diet, and you don't necessarily need to pay more for organic for most foods. 
I do get asked about artificial sweeteners a lot because a lot of my friends like to chug diet sodas. The thing to bear in mind here is that some of the studies are not that robust. So you might have seen headlines saying diet sodas cause Alzheimer's disease or diet soda causes stroke, and they're not necessarily true. And the thing that I worry about then is will people ditch the diet soda and just start drinking sugary soda when we know that those are linked to diabetes and other illnesses. Artificial sweeteners, the kind that you find in diet sodas, do not cause Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and cancer. You may have seen headlines that say that, but I think that they are misconstruing what the scientific studies are really showing. There have been studies showing some harmful effects of artificial sweeteners in rats. But then you have to take that with a large grain of salt to say that, well, just because it did something in a rodent's body, will that translate into happening in a human's body? But if you want to be really careful, you can just drink water. <laughs> the great message. You are a little bit taller first thing in the morning, probably no more than a centimeter though. And that's just because gravity compresses your joints during the course of the day. It's also why when astronauts come back to Earth after a space mission, they are a little bit taller than when they left Earth. There are studies showing that bad teeth, especially bad gums, can lead to heart disease and make you more susceptible. Uh, and that's because of the bacteria that causes gum disease can circulate through the blood and cause illness elsewhere. It's certainly something that makes us look at the patient holistically. So it's important to get your blood pressure checked and it's important to eat well, but it's also really important to get good dental hygiene and get routine checkups to make sure your gums are as healthy as everything else. There are some studies that are quite exciting that show that aspirin, which we already recommend for a, a number of things, might lower the risk of cancer. But there's still more research being done and there aren't a ton of medical organizations saying, hey, everyone should take an aspirin pill every day to prevent cancer. What we're learning is that it's certain types of cancer in particular and that there might be something about aspirin that prevents metastatic cancer, that prevents cancer cells from moving around the body. But even in that case, it might be that the aspirin works for that only in some people and not in everyone. I get so many questions about aspirin because it feels like every year we discover a new use for it. It is an incredible, incredible drug, but the jury's still out on aspirin preventing cancer. Please do not stop taking an antibiotic the moment you feel better if you still have more to complete the course. It's really important that if you have 10 days of pills, but you feel better on day four or day three even, you still have to finish that course of antibiotics so that the bug does not become resistant to the medicine. Antibiotics cannot help with a cold. Most colds, most sore throats are caused by viruses and antibiotics will not do anything to those. Antibiotics fight bacteria very specifically. So if you have a virus circulating in your blood, taking an antibiotic will not help. It's been circulating for ages that you should starve a fever and feed a cold. You just need to eat well and stay hydrated when you're not well. It is dangerous to starve yourself. Like that's a thing that we know that's proven. So if you have a fever, stay hydrated and eat well. The flu shot can definitely not <laughs> cause the flu. The flu shot might make you achy, but for the vast majority of us, getting the flu shot is a fantastic idea. You will not get the flu from it and it will keep you safe. I think we all grew up hearing that you should never go outside in the cold when your hair is wet or like make sure you bundle up and our mothers love doing that to us. During cold times is when there are more cold bugs circulating anyway. And also there is some research that shows that cold weather might impact the immune system, but I don't know if it's that robust. I think it's still a good idea though to wrap up very warm. You do not lose more heat from your head than anywhere else on your body. You can tell a little bit about what's making somebody sick from looking at the color of their sputum, which is the disgusting thing that you cough up. For example, if it's very clear, that's less likely to be an infection usually. If it's green or yellow, more likely to be a bacterial or viral infection. I think doctors are good at assessing the color of sputum when people are coughing up out of their lungs. If you are emptying your nose into a tissue, Probably looking at the color to try and figure out exactly what bacteria is causing it, that's not gonna be something you can assess. People wonder if their ears stop growing when the rest of them stops growing, and actually your ears carry on growing forever. 
So the current guidelines in the US are that men who have sex with men can only donate blood if they've been celibate for 12 months, which is ludicrous and stupid and unscientific. It wasn't until 2015, 30 years after we had a test for HIV AIDS, that gay men and bisexual men were told, yes, you can donate blood, but there was a major caveat. And that caveat was that men who have sex with men could only donate blood if they had been celibate for 12 months. Vaccines do not cause autism. I may get that tattooed on my face at some point in 2020. I'm kind of being sarcastic here, but if a patient was to ask me that, I would take their concerns really seriously and not be dismissive because I want to know why they think that. And I want to make sure that I reassure them that vaccines are safe and what they cause is a long life and good health. The best way to disinfect your hands is to wash them very well with water and soap and then to rub them clean. Hand sanitizer is good if you're in a bind, but it is nowhere near as good as washing your hands with soap and water. I get asked a lot of questions about alcohol gel, hand sanitizer, and like disinfectant wipes, and they are really useful. They do disinfect surfaces, but nothing is equivalent to disinfecting your hands as washing them with soap and water. It's true that many patients cared for by a female doctor have better health outcomes. There have been a number of studies that show that the patients do better, they live longer, they're less likely to be readmitted to the hospital if they're cared for by a doctor who is a woman. And at the same time, women doctors face lots of discrimination and get paid less than our male counterparts. It's hard to avoid misinformation. Sometimes there is so much false health news circulating, and sometimes you can just feel overwhelmed even with the correct information. I think the important thing to do is to talk to a healthcare provider that you feel like you can trust, who has an open mind, and someone that gives you the time and space to talk about what's really concerning you.